And the secret, I'll, I'll let your viewers in on the secret. You ready? People have to see it. They're already listening to you. Everybody's listening, whether you're rapping or not. So that I can hear what you're saying, that's not special. I need to be able to see what you're saying. So as you're freestyling, make everything visual in your mind and tell people so that they can see it. Focus on love. Love what's in focus. Aim for above because the ceiling's focus. Focus on love. Love what's in focus. Aim for above because the ceiling is bogus. Focus on love. And I joined it. And now I'm going to send you the link. Okay, I sent the link in there. Okay, so welcome the Prophet X for coming on um, another episode of Famous Rapper Convos. I'm part of the Famous Rapper Network on YouTube. Awesome. Um, you have been um, what, uh, my rap coach over the last couple months. Um, yeah. We started out meeting weekly and then we moved to every two weeks. Um, and those meetings have helped me a lot in terms of, you know, developing as a rapper, getting clear on um, what I should be doing, marketing my upcoming album. And, um, you know, I'm glad to have you here on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited. Cool. Um, so the Prophet X, how I always like to start these out is if you could give your full history with music, mm. starting from when you were a kid in three minutes. Three minutes. What, yep. What is that full story of how you got first involved up to where you are now? Let's see. I got one minute for each stage. Okay. I started off when I was about 12 years old playing guitar. Um, my mother told me, you're never going to be able to play guitar and we can't afford to buy a guitar. Uh, and then she kicked me out of the house shortly after that. I got a guitar from a friend's dad, taught myself how to play guitar. I've been playing for over 20 years. I have about eight or nine guitars. I played in rock bands went on tour. Somewhere right around that same time, I realized I could rap. So then I was playing guitar in bands and also rapping, recording demos. Then I started getting really good at rapping and started doing bigger shows, opening for artists. And then God found me, or I guess I should say I found God. And then I was like, oh, I don't want to rap about gangs and drugs and violence anymore. I want to rap for God. So as my relationship with God built, I started writing more and more rhymes for him, and I've been doing that for the last 20 years, operating my own record label and doing Christian rap. Wow. Yeah. That was quick. That was only like one minute. Ah, oh, okay. 20 yeah. years condensed into in one minute. Yeah. 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 When, uh, uh, um, could you elaborate a little bit more on uh, maybe talk about um, your record label um, or the different albums you've released over time? Right, so my record label is called Prophecy Records. Uh, we officially got established in 1999. And it was like, you know, the, the, the Y2K scare had everybody scared. So it was like, if we don't die tomorrow, I'm gonna start a record label. <laughs> so the year 2000 rolled around and we didn't die. Our computers didn't explode. So I was like, let me do this full time. So I established the record label called it Prophecy Records because I've always been known as the Prophet X. Um, <clears throat> the first artist that we signed, both him and I, we put out albums at the same time. And this is back when people didn't have, like when you think about the year 2000, there was no uh, studios in your bedroom like it is now. There wasn't that same access to be able to just record music, burn your CD. There was no internet music at all back then. You couldn't drop stuff on iTunes or whatever. So it was very cutting edge and a lot of work for us to build a record label from the ground up. But you look back now, it's 2020, 20 years later, we're still here when all the other record labels that came up during my time, they're all defunct, uh, all the people have retired. We still put out about four albums every year. Wow. Yeah. Um, when it came to setting up your record label, what was the most challenging part? Um, so for me, I'm the creative type. I'm not so much the, the background um, paperwork type. So one of, the, one of the first challenges was getting out of the creative mind of, I'm going to be in a studio all day and start getting into 
I have to work on publishing. I got to get a license. I got to open a bank account. I got to know about copyrights for all the artists. So getting out of the creative and into the business part was the first real challenge. But I also learned that um, that was probably the part that allowed our record label to keep going 20 years later. Like everybody's creative, but not everybody puts their ducks all in a row and has a bank account and makes the right investments, right? So mm -hmm. without those investments and without that background time that you spend on the paperwork, you're just going to be running it as a hobby. No money will come in from it. No royalties from radio play. So that was a huge challenge getting into the, getting out of the rapper mind into the business owner mind. Mm -hmm. And now I think I have it pretty well balanced, you know? Um, when it came to uh, building a team, um, who were some of the early core members of the mm -hmm. team? Um, and what made you choose them and how did they help you? So this is what's really interesting. Um, we, the artist on the label, one of the things that would get you on our label was, of course, a love for God, because we're a Christian rap label, but and an ability to really rap, but also having some other skill, because rappers are a dime a dozen nowadays, right? You had to have some other skill. So our team, what made us so strong is one guy had marketing skills. The other guy had uh, bookkeeping skills. This other guy over here had booking skills. So everybody brought their skills to the table at the beginning and we didn't have to hire people to do certain things. Um, whether it was like back when I didn't do the designs, we had a guy who's a rapper who also does our graphic designs. Mm -hmm. So everybody bringing what they have to the table made it so that we didn't have to pay tons of money for stuff that we could now do in, <clears throat> excuse me, do in-house. Mm, interesting. So the team that you built um, consisted of rappers, but and then you gave the, you know, the business tasks, you broke it up between the different rappers. Yeah. And so, so we did that. That was one thing. It's like, if you're going to be on the team app, so people would know if a certain rapper fit well on our team, because they would, in addition to be a rapper, he might have a side hustle as printing t-shirts. And then it'd be like, oh, you fit perfectly on Prophecy because we do all of our own merch, all our own designs, all our own booking. So if you're just a rapper who's like, yo, I write raps, you don't really fit well on our team, you're not going to be able to pull your weight. Mm. In addition to that, <clears throat> um, over the 20 years, it started getting very taxing on me to have to retrain every new person that we signed to the record label. So it kind of became a discipleship or a mentoring process where um, and I, I may have shown you the, the document before in one of our classes, when we create that document that outlines what's going to be on somebody's album, like, let's say you were signed to our record label and your album just released, it's now your responsibility instead of my responsibility to mentor the next guy who's working on his, his album. And that keeps the longevity of the record label lasting a long time. Because hmm. then I don't have to do everything. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, could you tell me, so what made you, if you didn't know, actually, my last name means profit, uh, oh. in Polish and Russian. Okay, um, what, awesome. yeah, what, what, what made you decide to choose like profit and prophecy as the names of your brand? So, and this is kind of a weird story, but, um, it's going to be a little spooky. I have some memories ever since I was a kid that didn't happen during my lifetime. So it's kind of been a family nickname, even when I was a kid, that they would call me Prophet or Little Prophet or whatever, because I have some memories that I can describe vividly. And I'll say to my mom or to my older sister, remember that time when I was running down the hallway and I pushed the screen door open and everyone's mouth would drop open and they'd be like, that didn't happen to you. You weren't there. They'd be like, that happened to so-and-so. And I was like, no, that happened to me. And my great-grandmother was there. And I would describe every detail. Details that there's no way I could have known. And so for that reason, they started calling me that just as a nickname. So it worked perfect when I started rapping. Now, when I was a secular rapper, I started going by profit also. And then I started to get pretty popular. And I'm actually opening shows for major artists. And I was like, I don't want to use that name anymore. So I created another name 
and I would only do Christian rap as prophet. And then I would do my secular rap under this other name that I don't tell anybody anymore. But um, mm-hmm. that name just stuck because it's kind of like a nickname. You know, when you're a kid, everyone's used to calling you this name. So it worked. And then uh, years ago, I think right around the time that we were starting the label, uh, me and the guys were like, what are we going to call it? And then there's a scripture that says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I was like, that's it. Let's call it prophecy. Because we, we rap about Jesus, obviously. So we called it Prophecy Records. And then it just blew up because all of my different entities are called prophecy. I have prophecy productions where I make beats and do recording for other artists. Um, I have prophecy pictures where I do music video production. Um, I own a website design company. And that was one of the first businesses called Prophecy Web Design. So everything, that's just my branding. It's important to have your own branding so that when people hear prophecy, I'm the first thing they think of, even if it's not related to me. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, So it sounds like you've done um, a lot of different businesses over the years. Um, What what has been, in your experience, what has been like the most profitable for you? Um, The most, so... Uh, the profitable for me comes in two ways. Um, so there's a profit in reaching people, right? So doing my Christian rap has been extremely profitable, not monetarily profitable, but um, I guess say in the relationship to people, the value of people. Um, maybe two years ago, a guy messages me on Facebook and he literally says, I am standing at the top of the building right now. He's messaging me on Facebook and he's like, and I was just about to jump off of this building to kill myself. And God told me, find this guy and listen to this song. And I'm like, what? That sounds crazy, right? And so the guy finds me on Facebook and he listens to this song. And he's like, I'm standing here. I'm crying. This song is talking about exactly what I am going through. I I have a really like heart-wrenching song called I Cannot Breathe Without You. <laughs> and the guy, God, he says, God told him to find that song, find me, find that song and listen to it. And he's like, I'm not going to throw myself off of this building. Now, the song is very inspirational. He ends up, I, I sent him back my phone number. The guy's on the building. I was like, call me right now. He calls me. He's like, I'm here. I'm, thank you so much for talking to me. Um, my wife left me, my, she took my kids. He's just pouring out five or six different terrible things in his life. And I'm just listening to the whole thing. And then God tells me he's still alive and all of those things can be repaired. And so I'm talking to the guy and I actually built a relationship with this guy and I talked with him occasionally still on Facebook to the point where his wife came back. He got a new job. He just had to believe, you know what I mean? And not give up. So for me, that's a huge profit margin for one song, save somebody's life. Yeah, wow. And then out of all those different entities that are music related, I would probably say the music production company. I think I've been doing that just as long as I've been doing the record label. But because I work with both Christian artists and secular artists, um, it produces twice as much profit. And I can sit here in my studio and make a beat in 20 minutes and I can put that beat on my website and sell it for a thousand dollars and 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 it'll sell I've literally sold beats for a thousand dollars before so it's like I can work for 20 minutes and make a thousand dollars or I can work for three or four months producing an album and put that album out and then make that same money but it's a lot more mm-hmm. yeah that makes sense yeah. wow interesting this yeah. uh two sides of that wait right. real quick Cool. <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, so you found that like uh, making music for other people has yeah. been has made you the most money. Um, mm-hmm. But you have still done the other things like the web design and um, making merchandise and stuff and pushing your own music. Um, you're also a pastor. Um, have you have you found that uh, being a pastor has helped you as a rapper? Yeah, um, absolutely. It has. Um, it's at, it, it has helped to grow my fan base and grow the relationship with the people. Um, so it works both ways. It's like being a pastor has helped me as a rapper and being a rapper has helped me as a pastor. Um, because now I have 10 times as much public speaking experience 
And there'll be times where I'm on the stage and I'm giving the message and whatever it is that I'm giving the message about, there may be a lyric in one of my songs and I'll say, boom, and I'll drop that lyric on the people. And all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, I forgot he was a rapper. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> It, it, it bridges the gap. It's like, oh, this guy is more like me than I thought he was. So that's uh-huh. pretty, yeah. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Busting out lyrics in the middle of the Sunday service. It happens, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, are those services, uh, do you write them beforehand? Do you have a script or are you kind of just freestyling? So um, it's a little bit of both. Um, I study and we have four services every week. So I'm constantly studying. If I'm not teaching a class or doing record label stuff, then I'm literally studying for my weekend services. And there'll be certain times, which is crazy, like usually Friday. Friday's our youth and young adult night. And I'll be like, I don't have anything. (laughs) I don't have a message. I haven't written it. It's five minutes before I have to go on stage. And I'll just go up there and God will give it to me at the exact moment. It's like I'm freestyling it, but it's almost like, He's just telling me what to say and I'm saying it. I don't have to be creative. He's doing the creative work, you know? Mm -hmm. Those are usually a lot of fun. People like that. (laughs) Yeah, you're uh, kind of just channeling it. Yeah, yeah, it's just coming through me. Cool, that's awesome. Um, So you have, um, so you're a pastor and you also have a record label. Um, I'm wondering if you have like, if you've written down like a discrete set of like core values that you use to um, run um, either of these uh, organizations? So for the, for the church, yeah, we have a really solid purpose statement and vision statement. Record label, we do. I haven't seen it in so long. I don't even remember what it is. Um, once I became a pastor, uh, the record label uh, inadvertently kind of took a back seat to that because to be honest with you, you don't operate your record label on an everyday basis unless your artists are in the studio recording or you've just released an album or you're going on tour, which um, maybe one or two of my guys is in the studio recording right now. And we've taken a break from that because we moved. Um, so no one has been in here for a few weeks. Um, and because of the whole COVID situation, nobody's really on the road right now. So it's kind of shut everything down, which has made me push it to a back burner and more important things that are happening on an everyday basis are taking more of a forefront to that right now. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm, I was just about to ask something. Uh, oh, oh, uh, like what city are you in? So I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm, I'm basically from Los Angeles, like for the last... 20 something years, our record label has been based out of Los Angeles, California, uh, specifically the San Fernando Valley. But about two years ago, I moved here to Phoenix and uh, it's thriving here. So that's what we're doing. Nice. And it's it's interesting that you mentioned that because when we were in, uh, when we were in Los Angeles, I always feel like the number one thing that you have to do as an artist is not be big in other states other cities people have to know you in your own area when you do a concert in your own area it's like that should be your biggest show but how come every artist is always like yo i can't wait to go to new york nobody knows you in new york they're not going to show up for your show but in your own hometown is when like if you do an event at your own place everyone should be there so Mm -hmm. i feel that same way here when we were in california it was like we were the go-to record label for Christian rap because we're the local guys. We do a concert there, it's big. We go to Vegas, not as many people are gonna show up. And I I actually proved that that's the case because now that we've moved to Arizona and all of our artists, except for one, are on, they live in uh, here in Arizona, except for one, there's still one in Los Angeles. We don't do anything in Los Angeles anymore. And he doesn't really do much, but here we're kind of known as that record label in Arizona. That's yeah. very important to be the biggest guy in your own area. Mm, in a specific niche. niche. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so if you were to look forward like uh, 12 months from now, um, what are some of like your major goals? Um, I don't know. So it seems like you're not currently putting out music as 
Oh, wait, no, you have an album coming out pretty soon. I have an album coming out in two weeks. And this is my first release that's not uh, exclusively on Prophecy Records. Uh, last year, um, I signed a deal with AWOL. And AWOL is the record label portion of Cobalt Music. Cobalt has huge people. It's a distribution company. So they distribute 50 Cent and Childish Gambino and Red Hot Chili Peppers and all these major artists they distribute. They also have their own record label. So I signed a deal for their record label last year. And this is going to be my first full length album that's getting put out by AWOL. So mm. <clears throat> one of the reasons why I did that is they offer tour support. And uh, what I'm really hoping for is once everything calms down with the whole COVID situation to be able to tap into their tour support because they have larger artists that are on their record label and that they do distribution for, they're, the way that they do it is they take some of their smaller artists and put them on tour with their larger artists if it's a good fit. So who knows, I could be on tour with 50 Cent next year as long as we're not wearing masks. <laughs> so who knows, we'll see what happens. But yeah, I have a new album coming out in exactly two weeks. Um, okay. And it's, it's a new album, but it's not really a new album. I kind of tricked the fans in that um, it's a remix album. So it's 14 tracks, but all of them are remixes of songs from uh, that I've already released on albums before. I just put uh, brand new like trap beats or West Coast beats, just new school style beats. And I re-wrapped all of the songs and I flipped them. So one of them might've been a total slow song before and now it's a club banger. Or it might've been a club banger before and now it's like a laid back riding West Coast so every song is totally different, but my fans will already know the lyrics. It's just going to feel like, you know, 2021 music instead of it being year 2000, 2001 music. Mm, interesting. So it's like a refresh. Yeah, basically like a refresh. Um, and what I did just prior to that is I released my first Greatest Hits album. After 20 years, I'm doing a Greatest Hits album. It's got like 15, maybe 16 tracks on it. And it's the most popular live performance uh, material because we do a lot of live performances. So mm -hmm. if I go out and I rap a song and the crowd's just sitting there with their arms folded like this, I don't do that song anymore. <laughs> if yeah. it doesn't have a good response, but the ones that have the best response, I put those onto a greatest hits album. Because it's, like, it's not like we're getting radio play where we can say this is the number one song. So I have to judge the popularity or the effectiveness of my songs off of um, crowd participation like how if i do this song in front of a hundred people versus in front of a thousand people how was the crowd response mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah read the crowd get that feedback to figure out which songs you should keep doing um yeah. which ones maybe you should stop doing yep that's what cool. i did and then um this new album are the beats kind of designed to be um like better for live performances like did you have live performances in mind when making this album this album no i didn't really i the thing that i had in mind most on this album was a current sound so if, if, when i'm taking a song like the first song that i did uh the song was written in the year 2000 it was released in 2004 and it was a huge song but what i'm saying in that song is more relevant today than it was in the year 2000 you know what i mean so Mm -hmm. uh, it's I, I kind of chose that one because of the content. Then I picked the beat and I wanted that beat and that flavor of the song to sound like you just turned on the radio, you're going to hear this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I didn't really pick them so much for live performances, but luckily they do work. And you know what's interesting? I noticed with a lot of the um, artists that are coming out right now, their music is not, it's not real hype stuff because everyone's doing the sing-along rap and the, the slow trap beats or the emo style rap. It's not your crazy, get it crunk, jumping everywhere, hip hop stuff. It's laid back and relaxed hip hop stuff. So mm -hmm. that's- Yeah, that makes sense. The live environment a lot. Yeah, totally. Um, so if you were to think I had like 12 months from now, like what are some major milestones that you hope to hit? Or like, what are some changes that are happening in your life now that you are excited to see play out um, or like, what are some things, you know, that you see coming up? So um, 
one of the first things is with this new album that's coming out, I'm the first and only Christian rap artist on the AWOL label. So and this album is coming out, AWOL slash Prophecy Records. I'm hoping that that's going to be huge because I would love for them to pick up my entire record label as and make an imprint. So now Prophecy Records slash AWOL and all of my artists are getting that tour support and that additional advertising stuff like that because they they work on your spotify playlist um, um curation all of that stuff so i'm hoping that the rest of my artists can also benefit from that if it goes really well with me this year um, i do have another album that i've been writing i would say for the last maybe two years even before i did the greatest hits album before i did the remix album i already have five tracks written for that and I haven't released a brand new album with new songs on it since 2015, I think. So I'm overdue for some new words to come out. So within the next maybe year, I hope to put out one more brand new, completely brand new album before I, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting older. So I, I don't have the ability to go out on tour like I used to. And now that I'm a pastor, I have a responsibility here. So. Maybe it's time for me to play the background, focus more on the record label, and hand off the gauntlet to the next guy on my label who's younger, who's still going to be out there grinding hard. Mm, totally. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, this is just a totally different question. Um, so what is your experience with freestyle rapping? Um, mm. How did you first learn how to freestyle? Is, and is it something that you used um, while creating music? Yeah. So... Um, I used to be scared to death to freestyle. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> when we first started, uh, there was a guy on the label, his name was Phenom. And dude was a phenomenal freestyler. He's like, he, he, he broke it into a formula that made it possible for me to understand how he was doing it. But his freestyle was so amazing that people would never believe that it was freestyle. I would be on tour with this guy and he would be like, I'm just going to freestyle my whole set. And he would get up there and freestyle every lyric. He would have his hooks playing, but he would freestyle every lyric to like four songs back to back. And we'd be like, wow, that is crazy. And he'd be like, no, it's actually pretty easy. So he taught me the formula. And that's some of what I teach in the rap classes now, oh, wow. the freestyling formula. Once I learned that, I kind of became known like, the phenom guy where I can get up there and I can freestyle literally a whole set of songs, four songs back to back without repeating myself. And I do that regularly. If I have a concert where I'm doing more than three or four songs, two of those songs are designed where there's a hook and I'll have everybody pull something out of their pocket and I'm going to freestyle about that thing. But the interesting thing is I'm going to tie whatever they have into uh, Christianity or the gospel or the Jesus message. So Let's say somebody pulls out some keys. I'm going to talk about how they need to have the key to the kingdom. And, I, and it, it's, it's cool. And it really engages with the audience. They're like, wow, he just did that, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, are, you able, are you willing to share what the formula is or like a 30-second version of it? Right. Okay, so I'm just going to make it really simple. I'm going to try to put the formula in a nutshell. Um, what I do is you have to have a really strong rhyming vocabulary. Because in the rap classes I teach, I tell people, your rhymes are not the creative part. Your creative part is the transitional phrases. You did not create light to rhyme with sight. That was already created. It just naturally rhymes. But if you don't have either one of those words in your vocabulary, then your freestyle sucks off top. Because <laughs> you're going to yeah. be like, yo, I'm, it's the middle of the night. Oh, what rhymes with night? I don't know sight, light, bright. If you don't have those words in your vocabulary, then you can't freestyle with them. So step one is pack your brain with words that rhyme. So you have a huge rhyming vocabulary. And then there's the second part, which is the transitional phrase, which is how you go from one word that rhymes to the next word that rhymes. And that's where you get to be as creative as possible. And the secret, I'll, I'll let your viewers in on the secret. You ready? People have to see it. They're already listening to you. Everybody's listening, whether you're rapping or not. So that I can hear what you're saying, that's not special. I need to be able to see what you're saying. So as you're freestyling, make everything visual in your mind and tell people so that they can see it. 
your freestyles will never fall off for as long as you can see what you're saying and they'll think you're the best freestyler because they can see what you're saying. Mm, um, are you saying um, rap about things that are in the real world or you're saying visualize something in your mind and then rap about that visual? Right, visualize it in your mind and rap about the visual. So instead of just saying, yo, I'm hot like fire. Okay, I'm listening to you, but I can't see it. But if you said, my rhymes are hotter than diving head first into a volcano. My, right? See, that's the creative part. <laughs> you just entered insane mode. Right. So it's crazy. And you could see this guy jumping. Ah! And the people will relate to what they're able to see more than what they're able to hear. They'll be like, yo, it was so crazy. People, what's really weird is people remember my freestyles after I get off the stage. And I'm like, really? I said that? I have no idea <laughs> I have no idea what I've said. I watch back the video and be like, yo, that was nuts. I know. I'm, I'm being creative. I'm not listening to myself. I'm just freestyling. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. Um, <laughs> cool. Wow. Um, so we have about three minutes left. Um, is there anything that you haven't talked about that you think is important um, to get out there to the viewers? I do. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this is probably the most important thing that I could say to anyone who is a rapper, is used to be a rapper, thinking about being a rapper, their mama is a rapper. Look, be yourself. You'll be famous because of who you are, not because of who you're like. Think about that for a second. But like, they, they don't want to be like, oh, um, Pro Rock is famous because he's like Eminem or he's like Little Dicky. No, Pro Rock is famous because he's Pro Rock. You know what I mean? He's got his own style. He does it his own way. And it's authentic. Now, a lot of people who want to be rappers, they're not being authentic. They're being a character that they're creating. Basically, mm -hmm. you're not a rapper. You're an actor acting like a rapper. And the difference is, if I'm going to listen to a gangster rapper, I want to hear a real gangster who's actually shot a gun, who actually carries a gun, who's been shot. I don't want to hear a kid in his bedroom writing songs about what he thinks the gangster life is like, because he's not going to be convincing to me. Nobody wants to be lied to. And if you are going to lie to me, you better make it super convincing and entertaining. And if it's not, click, I'm going to go to the guy that I know is not lying to me. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have, uh, so you've, you've listened to some of the songs off of my upcoming album. Yeah. Um, do you, could you do like a quick testimonial or like, yeah. why, sh why do you think people should um, give my music a chance? All right. Let me tell you why you should listen to David Pro Rock. It is very creative. He still has the original art form of hip hop in there. The majority of the lyrics are probably freestyle and it's brilliant freestyle along with the good beat along with the new school flavor but the creativity is still there we're in a, a day and age where mumble rap has taken over and there's nothing original coming out it's all rhythmic they're saying stuff because it rhymes or because it feels good not because it's actually something brand new or something that people haven't thought about and when i listen to david pro rock's music i felt that feeling like i listen to your stuff I don't want to rap again because it's so creative. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was great. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Cool. So this has been the Prophet X. You have a new album coming out. Um, I mean, by the time this is released, it'll already be out. So how can people find it? Find me on Spotify. Look me up under the Prophet X. The new album is called Refocused, Remixed, and Remastered. No, Re Refocused, Remixed, and Reloaded. <laughs> it's that Refocused. new. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> refocused remixed and reloaded by the prophet x it's available yes. now yeah. so um great awesome thank you so much for for doing this thanks uh, for having me I'll see this you has been time. fun yeah right. and um uh, this is the end of our scheduled session as well um so i'll see you in two weeks two I weeks think. awesome right. cool thank yeah. you so much right. bye Love what's in focus, aim for above, cause the ceiling is bogus. Focus on love, love what's in focus, aim for above, because the ceiling's bogus. Focus on love, love what's in focus, aim for above, cause the ceiling is bogus. I wanna lay down a never-ending road, we never go to